Welcome to episode 558 of the Barcelona Podcast, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and the team is pretty sluggish today. So yeah, it took me a few hours. Maybe I was feeling sluggish too, as well as the team was. But we are here for the five headlines. Napoli is up midweek, so there's a lot of big stories to think about and talk about. So let's dive right into these five headlines. You know, subscribe, Patreon, merch store, all that good stuff. Discord, close Facebook group, that you can follow along with me. Sure, but let's do it. The 2-1 win for Barcelona against Celta de Vigo. Here's your five headlines. Headline one is positional play, but out of position. I did want to at least take a few hours to take a breath and think about what I could add to this game because it does feel like deja vu over and over and over again. Barcelona played poorly. Xavi was upset about it. They know that they need to do better next time. But what was it that was actually bad? We're going to get that in a second because first, of course, it was the first Barcelona start for Vida Roque. I do have some notes on him as we go along, but we know that he was better in his substitute appearances. Overall, not his best day. Again, we'll get to that. Gunawan was the player who got the rest from that starting 11. I had pleaded midweek and for the past few weeks that Lamine Mall be the guy, but instead he's taking the corners and he is taking on the same huge responsibility that he has in recent weeks. So maybe Xavi and the training staff know more than me. Seemingly with all the injuries, maybe they don't, but it seems like they do because they decide to rest the guy in his 30s who never gets a break instead of the 16-year-old who never gets a break. So maybe they're wiser than me. Hopefully neither of them get injured. And let me them all, I just cross my finger and say, hopefully he just continues to get through this period. I'm hoping that he gets an easy summer, but we know that he's probably going to go to the Euros with Spain, all that stuff. But let's worry about that later because I do want to at least regale you with what I saw as a really big issue in this game. And that was that Barcelona, a team so devout to positional play, seemed to really struggle with it. Numerically, Celta de Vigo were not really pressing for much of that game. They were settled into that 4-4-2 mid-block, low block, but they weren't often pressing. And so when De Jong and Christensen in that double pivot would drop in between the center backs, that meant that you now had three behind the ball with just two players for Celta de Vigo who weren't really pressing you at all. So I thought the buildup was pretty plotting for Barcelona when Celta de Vigo were not pressing. But I felt the bigger problems were when Celta, on the rare occasion, were pressing, where Barcelona should have been easily able to get a numerical advantage up the field, but things would break down. Particularly in that first 10 minutes, Pedri and Lamine Mall, they were slow to check to the ball. And I understand what they're trying to do. They're trying to have the ball roll across them. And then when they do get held up, though, or they can't get all the way and move their hips underneath the defender... And if the referee then doesn't call that foul when they go down, then Celta is off to the races. And I do say Lamini Mall and Pedri because they both did it at least once in the first 10 minutes where they lost the ball, particularly on the wing, so it didn't really come to much for Celta, but they were still losing the ball by checking back a bit slow and trying to use one move to get by their defender, but it wasn't working. But also in their defense, I said their names, but unlike the likes of Man City or Bayer Leverkusen and Maybe I'm just biased about the positional play thing now because I really did a deep dive. I searched out different feedback and tactical feedback from the Bayer Leverkusen and Bayern Munich game from last weekend because Bayer Leverkusen were so impressive to me, building out in different phases from the first phase to the second phase, getting out on counters, building up from the back and attacking Bayern Munich in every way that you can be attacked without the ball, with the ball. And I was so impressed at what they were doing. I immediately want to almost copy and paste that idea to Barcelona and say, what is Barcelona not doing? And very fundamentally, for Pedri and Lamine Mall, in their defense, they were trying to have the ball roll across them so they could push it forward to get upfield because there was also no square ball available for them, which is what needs to come next. That's Koundé, Cancelo, De Jong, or Christensen. One of them or all of them were out of position. As is the complaint, this is a team, and I said at the jump, seemingly devout to positional play, while being out of position. And you saw the frustration from Xavi on the sideline. We're at a point where now that he's leaving, but it's been like this for a few months when a player still thought he was sticking around. I'm not sure what it is. Is it that he struggles, like one of my favorites, Terry Henry did as a manager, to get the ideas in his head as a legend and put them into the feet and the legs of his players? Or is it that Xavi is naive in believing that the players can figure these things out in the chaos that existed in this game? I'm not sure, but clearly the patterns are not there, the trust isn't there, and there are fundamental issues that I'm getting to the point where I do think a different voice and another coach might be able to solve some of these problems. Because simple patterns of passing that I know that these players, I've seen these individual players, either for other teams or for Barcelona in rare occasions, they have more talent, they have more ability than they show, 
And there's something that's fundamentally broken. And I think you see it most when another team is putting the press on. I think the rest of this game will be pretty, pretty simple to breeze through. So I just want to get that big idea out at the start. The 10th minute, let's jump ahead there. Lini Mall had a shot. Because yeah, I gave one critique to Lamini Mall, but I thought he was still Barcelona's most active attacker and really important to any result that Barcelona was going to get in this game until I felt like he really gassed out there late in the second half. But still, he managed to make something happen. His shot was saved by the keeper there in the 10th minute, but it was still a good attempt and simple buildup by Barcelona by overloading the middle of the field and working the ball vertically. Good to see. But yet a minute later, Roses and Thorns. Cancelo was caught upfield and Vida Roque didn't take his place at left back. De Jong and Christensen, meanwhile, were looking to pick up the runner centrally. And this is a major issue that we saw a few times from Vida Roque and Cancelo, where if Cancelo doesn't release the ball early, then the help or the double comes to take the ball off him. And Vida Roque is now too far away or upfield. And that left too much space between Cancelo and Roque in behind him. That was a problem. And then you look at the middle of the field. You say, well, where was Vida Roque? Is he the one who's supposed to be trailing and picking up some money from the middle? So that would have meant that De Jong or Christensen would have to come over to the left back position. Or did they drop in? And that means Kobarski comes to the left. That's a simple, fundamental total football thing that these players have grown up on that been around for 60 years now. And yet it seems to be a fundamental thing that Barcelona is not getting. Is that on Roque? Is that on Cancelo? I don't know, but again, Cancelo has to release it early or Vida Roque needs to drop in and defend for him if Cancelo is going to be the one to try to push forward on that left wing. Like, those are fundamental things. 15th minute, good counter by Barca. Pedri gets fouled, and it's a yellow card for Allende. Barcelona couldn't take advantage of that. But 22nd minute, it's also good pressure from the Belgrana. The attack breaks down with a poor touch from Vida Roque, which really did sum up his day. He was in the right spots, but he had the wrong touch. I don't want to jump to any conclusions. Maybe he was a little nervous in his first start, but I also think maybe he's just not up to speed yet. That's why with Ferran Torres and Jao Felix that Xavi was being patient with Vida Roque, but he got his first start and hopefully these touches just get a little bit better. Iago Aspas was also fading to Kubarsi's side there in the first half, playing in that half space between Cancelo and Kubarsi. Aspas created everything for Celta though, and Kubarsi had to keep his eye on him. Jaspis had that really nice diagonal pass near the end of the first half, but I still thought Kabarsi, yes, we're going to talk about the goal in the second half, but as we know, Kabarsi wasn't really involved in that. So I think that Kabarsi can add, hey, I did a pretty good job and dealt with Thiago Aspas to his pocketbook or whatever he's writing down the name of these strikers that he's dealing with and these legends that he's working with. So I thought Kabarsi was good on Thiago Aspas in the first half. Headline two is one two punch, 44th minute. It's still Lamini Mall and Lewandowski. That was the show. And that's how I think I'm going to remember this game, hopefully, the positives of it. Lamini Mall got a cross on Lewandowski, but the keeper got to it first. The few times that Barcelona did ratchet up the pressure and got high on that press, they had success. It worked for them. De Jong had a few takeaways in the final third that were nice to see that got Barcelona off to the races. And they earned, I thought, the 45th minute 1-0 goal. They hadn't lost it after that punch from the keeper from the Lewandowski attempt on the Lamini Mall cross. And Lamini Mall makes the run. Three came to him, which is a breakdown by Celta de Vigo, but doesn't matter. He gives it to Lewandowski, and the midfielder hesitated. That left Lewandowski 1v1 with the center back, while Vida Roque was making the good run 1v1 with Mingetha to keep him wide. But this goal is mainly about Lewandowski and his class and his skill, and remembering he knows how to score goals. One touch to set himself up, and then the full fury of frustration into the back of the net. Good stuff from Lewandowski. I do give him a hard time when I think it was his fault in a bad result or they're playing poorly, but I put very little, even if this was a draw, by the way, or even if they had lost this match, I thought it was one of the better performances, even without the brace from Lewandowski. I thought every time he had a chance to affect the game, he did in positive ways. And maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I actually thought his body language, maybe he does feel a little guilty that Xavi is leaving, that he might have been able to save him. But I do think that Lewandowski's body language was better in this match from at least what the cameras had picked up. So hats off to Lewandowski. We'll get to his second goal later. Headline three then, who's watching Jaspas? Diego Martinez on for Araujo. This is the negative headline. That moved Kabarsi to the right. Positive is that Araujo is just dealing with fatigue. Xavi said as much after the game, so he should be fit and ready to go for Napoli, which is what Barcelona are going to need. Araujo healthy. But for some reason, Barcelona were not prepared at the back, as has been the case so many times. I talked about positional play stuff too, but yeah, Xavi and whatever messages he has for his back line. We can point to individual errors sometimes, but this time around, I think we point to a complete cohesion between the midfield center backs when the 1-1 is scored for Celta de Vigo, 47th minute. No one picking up Yago Aspas. If there's one guy in the scouting report, I know he's not having the best season because, yeah, he's getting a bit up there in age, but 
He's a Celta legend. He's the one guy you've got to pick up in the middle of the field making those late runs. Kubarsi, though, stepped to Strand Larson, who is a big body and held off Kubarsi well. Mingetha then, credit to him. He had some good forwards on Akuman. Felt like he wasn't up to the Barca level, but what the heck does that mean anymore? Because he was good enough to be on the field with the Bograna today. Plays the back heel to Aspa, so then Kunde had two players to deal with, so he doesn't step, and immediately everything is falling apart. It's deflected off Kunde. Their second might have gotten to it. It wasn't the best shot, more of a pass from Aspas, but still finds a back net on the deflection. And there were so many guys I guess I could have blamed here. If you want to put in the comments below, if you watch it in slow motion and see who didn't pick him up or what miscommunication occurred, was it Inega Martinez? Probably. Was it De Young? Christensen, Pedri, I don't know. Somebody didn't pick him up. And he had so much space that this is almost a team error. I'm not sure who to blame. Xavi can worry about that tomorrow in the film session. Headline four is sluggish second half. 58th minute, Gundogan and Rafinha come on to Rita Roque and for Christensen. And while the team started pretty slowly in the second half, I thought, again, around the 60th minute, Gundogan did add something to it. He had a free kick attempt that wasn't too far away. And I think he added a little bit of a sense of urgency, but the rest of the team was not really up to it. 71st minute, Yago Aspas, almost some trouble for Barcelona. Cancelo, though, defended it well. And when I do get to say it on the rare occasion, I'll say it. Cancelo defended it well, just as Koundé had done with a step clearance a few minutes prior. But it still was sloppy play from Barca in the second half. There were giveaways in the middle of the park. Off throw-ins that were giveaways. Those are inexcusable. And the fouls were 13 on Barca and 11 on Celta by the end of this match. Telling you that Celta, whether it's the win there and some of the conditions... Didn't look to be raining, but it usually is in Vigo. The air is very humid in Vigo as well. So I don't know. It's a difficult place to play. I'm not defending Barcelona, but I'm saying that they were clearly out of their game, out of their rhythm, and that's as much Celta as is Barca stinking up the joint. I don't think there was enough to the Sanchez tackle on Rafinha that occurred in the second half, as painful as it was for Rafinha taking the knock on the head. But I thought his heading motion arguably took him into Sanchez. And even if we were to argue that it was a foul on Sanchez, I don't think it was enough or any bit of intention that you could see to call a foul in that circumstance. Rafinha shine on his head tomorrow or not. I thought his crosses were really poor from the left, looking like he was lacking fitness as well. Even though he came on, his legs looked heavy. All of his crosses felt like they were short, which is odd to me because on his favorite left foot, you would think that they'd be a bit long to the back posts and he put too much power on it. But instead, they were all short, easily cleared, and that gave Celta de Vigo some advantages. It didn't look comfortable, but it does show you the hierarchy that Xavi does trust Lamine Mall more on the right wing than he seemed to trust Rafinha to take his place and move Lamine Mall over on the left. Because it doesn't seem to me that Lamine Mall would be worse on the left than Rafinha was on the left, then Rafinha would be on the right. And it just, I think, shows the hierarchy here where the 16-year-old fits in the pecking order and how important he's been to Barcelona. 76th minute, Fermin Lopez on for Pedri. And Fermin, like he does, added a bit of verticality to proceedings. He did make Barcelona look a bit more desperate than they had looked before, which is a good sign. And so I'm going to jump ahead now to the 86th minute to say that Barcelona really picked up the urgency here. They had a lot more energy, and I thought De Jong started that by saving Cabarsi in the 86th minute. He didn't do that being De Jong much on the day, and he went as Barcelona went, where when he was sluggish, I felt like Barcelona was sluggish. And for any comments about De Jong, I thought he was good to fine in this match. And for anything about De Jong and that inconsistency or consistency or expecting him to be the best all the time, all that chatter about De Jong, that was talked about on the Friday podcast that I did with Rob's. Whether you're listening on the podcast apps or you're watching on YouTube, I send you back to the last podcast all about De Jong. And then headline five is Lewandowski penalties. Barcelona did win today. I want to remind you of that. As bad as Barcelona played, they still won the game. They still got the three points regardless of how it happened. 93rd minute, Lamine Mall saves Barcelona with a penalty. And this is a good job by Lewandowski and build up. Again, I'm going to credit him when he deserves it. It was a really good job by Lewandowski to come over to Lamine Mall's side and give him some space to dribble into. The teenager then played him in behind because Lewandowski basically screened the two defenders, setting a pick, like a basketball pick, and then Lewandowski running into the space in behind, trusting that Lamine will get it to him. He did, and then Lewandowski's cross bouncing around the box. It wasn't the best cross, but Fran Beltran and that chaos, Barcelona living in the chaos, swung his leg around, fouled the 16-year-old. Easy call. Thankfully, we don't have anything to talk about. Finally, 91st minute, here comes the first penalty attempt. Lewandowski, I don't know if he fell for all the distractions or it really was just his run-up that I haven't seen a single person that loves Lewandowski's hop, skip, and run-up. All the Celta tricks, though, and Lewandowski kicking it without conviction, though, even after he did the run-up he wanted to do. But the keeper was off his line, so it's a repeat. 
And this time, Lewandowski scores it, 97th minute. Same thing, though, the hop and the skip, but just getting by with the hop. And the second time, he finds the corner, places it where he needs to go. And I did see afterwards, the ruling was that because the goalkeeper had come off his line again, that apparently does negate the fact that Rafinha and two Celta de Vigo players had entered the box because with the goalkeeper off the line, the goal was scored. So if it hadn't been scored, they would have redone it again. But because it was scored, everything was negated. Lewandowski scored his 50th goal for Barcelona, which means he has passed both Terry Henry at 49 and David Villa at 48, which does go to show that people tend to remember the moment for a goal more than the goal itself. Because I can say with earnest that Lewandowski scored more skillful individual goals than David Villa did at Barcelona. But Villas are so much more memorable because how and when they happen, and usually what the other members of the team did to make the goal happen. And this is true throughout Barcelona's history too. It's why we don't really remember any remarkable moments from Maradona's time at Barcelona or his teammate Bernd Schuster around the same time, and it didn't really help Schuster's legacy that he moved to Real Madrid in the way he did. They were awesome players, and they did some awesome things, and there is a lack of video evidence and a lack of positive results, but it does mean that so much of any magic that they had at Barcelona has now been lost to time. It's a different era, though. Now in the age of digital everything, it'll be easier to recycle Lewandowski stuff. But in terms of what the impact and the memory, the living memory, I'd say, 40 years from now, will Lewandowski wind up like the other two? Now, I am just speaking out loud here, and I do think that the Champions League and potentially next year are going to play a big factor in that. But it does make you think about these records and the total numbers, because I just throw the stats at you sometimes. But there is weight to these stats and these numbers. So credit to you, Lewandowski, for scoring 50 goals for Barcelona in two seasons, a short amount of time. So good on him. He's one of the best goal scorers of this generation, of course, if not arguably the best out-and-out goal scorer for the last 15 years, maybe. I don't know. Ronaldo has an argument, and of course, Messi, the other one there. But we're not done with the game. Kubarsi, big header on the free kick in the 101st minute. Then the only one smart enough to blast the clearance upfield a minute later. And I'm not just praising the 17-year-old the way that I praise the 16-year-old to mean them all. I think Kubarsi has been Barcelona's most consistent defender over the last month, where I've had, we'll say, the least negative things to say about him than the others. And then Lamine Mall, same thing. I think I've had the least negative to say about Lamine Mall as the forwards go in the last month. So I call it as I see it. I'm not just being biased and saying, oh, it's pie in the sky. These kids are great. No. The kids have been really important, and there's a reason why they're in the starting lineup, and Xavi's having a hard time taking them out of it. Last note, because if you're still with me here, I think the three points do matter to you. This was Barcelona's only second win away at Celta since 2015, and the first time they beat Celta home and away in the same season since the 2013-14 season. So that was a lot of Lionel Messi taking it to Celta de Vigo without getting the positive results. So with Napoli on Wednesday, I do hope that this was a game that they had one eye on, to try to keep everybody healthy, try to just any way on the road in Vigo, get the three points. Because Atletico Madrid, they destroyed Las Palmas today, and yet they got the same three points that Barcelona did. The worrisome sign, of course, is that Barcelona is limping. They stink heading into that tie with Napoli. But fortunately for Barcelona, I'm not sure if I'm going to talk to you between now and then. If I am going to preview it, the main headline of that preview is going to be that Barcelona stink, and Kool-Aid's know that, but Napoli also kind of stink, and their fans know that. So this is a tie of two teams that won their league last season and both fan bases, I don't think fully understand how the other team has kind of played like garbage this season, but that'll be on Wednesday. So worst case scenarios, I talk to you Wednesday night. Again, I might talk to you before that, but until then, if I don't subscribe to the channel, of course, Patreon, podcast apps, merch store, close Facebook group, social media, everywhere, you know where to find me. As always, until next time, Forza Barca.